Thank you for tuning in to today's Genuous Week webinar entitled Epigenetic Activation of the Interferon Response to Sensitize Cancers to Immune Therapy, presented by Dr. Catherine Ciappinelli. Dr. Ciappinelli received her PhD in Developmental Regenerative and Stem Cell Biology from Washington University in St. Louis under the supervision of Dr. Paul Goodfellow in 2012. She pursued postdoctoral studies at Johns Hopkins University with Dr. Stephen Bailin investigating the epigenetic control of immune signaling in cancer cells. Her research focuses on how epigenetic therapies can be used against cancer, specifically in the context of arming the host immune system to fight cancer cells. In 2017, she joined the George Washington University Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Tropical Medicine as an assistant professor. Without further ado, here is Dr. Catherine Ciappinelli. Thank you. Today, I'm going to go over um, some basics of epigenetic therapy as well as immunology um, and then talk about some of the work that we've done in this space um, in the immune regul in the reg epigenetic regulation of um, the non-coding genome and how that interacts with the immune system. Um, so first I wanted to define epigenetics for everyone. This is a cover of Time Magazine um, from uh, about 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Um, and it was, you know, covered in kind of a sensational way of why your DNA isn't your destiny. Um, but really, you know, what we think of as epigenetics is modifications to, to um, DNA transcription or DNA regulation that are not encoded in the DNA itself. Um, and this is a schematic of how your DNA is packaged. So our DNA, which is negatively charged, is wound around positively charged histones here. These are your histone proteins. Um, and there are lots of modifications to these histones that determine how our genes or non-genic elements are transcribed. So really epigenetics is going to, epigenetic marks here are going to determine um, the transcription of the different pieces of our genome. So here you can see different histone modifications, that's these H3 uh, modifications, as well as DNA methylation. So that's noted here. Um, and then all of this is involved in packaging our DNA into tightly wound chromosomes. And I'm going to talk a lot about DNA methylation. And so this is a little intro slide on DNA methylation. Um, this is an addition of a methyl mark at CPG dinucleotides. Um, and this is added by a DNA methyl transferase. So if you have your two strands of DNA over here that I'm circling, um, you have your cytosine here, a methyl transferase can add a methyl group to that cytosine. And then during DNA replication, a different type of methyl transferase maintains that. So as you're um, replicating your DNA, um, the new strand is methylated by a maintenance methyl transferase. Um, and these patterns in general are erased in very early development, reestablished in early development, and maintained through the remainder of development. And one of the ways that cytosine methylation can um, silence genes is it can recruit histone deacetylase chromatin modeling complexes. So here's your methylated cytosine. There are proteins that bind to this called methyl cytosine binding proteins that bring in repressive complexes, such as the H-DAC complexes. Um, histone deacetylases remove acetyl groups from histones. Uh, and in general, uh, acetyl groups are negatively charged and push away the negatively charged DNA from the histone. So acetyl groups are activating so HDACs are going to um, silence the genome and promote a more condensed chromatin structure. So both of these, DNA methylation and HDACs, are going to repress transcription and compact the chromatin. So one of the things about cancer um, it, is that just as we can gain mutations and tumor suppressor genes to promote cancer, we can also have silencing of tumor suppressors. So on the left here, I show um, a a tumor suppressor gene that has suppressive marks such as DNA methylation on the, the DNA as well as repressive histone modifications. Um, we can use drugs in cancer including DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, the two that I'll talk about in my talk are called 5-azacytidine and 5-aza2-deoxycytidine and we abbreviate them as aza and DAC to remove DNA methylation. We can also use HDAC inhibitors to inhibit these HDAC enzymes produce more acetylation and turn tumor suppressor genes on. And this is from 2007, so these have been used in, in the clinic for certain malignancies for, um, for quite some time actually, so including um, for AML and CTCL. Um, and the, there's now great interest in using them in solid tumors as well. 
Um, this is just an example of a, one of the first clinical trials for the DMT inhibitor azacitidine in AML, in adult leukemia. So going from the left here, this is at the beginning of the trial where all the patients are alive. The blue line is, is a DMT inhibitor and the yellow line is conventional chemotherapy. And you can see that the, the patients um, did significantly better on the DMT inhibitor. Um, so the idea of using these is to reverse epigenetic changes in cancer and thus be a, a good cancer treatment. So the C. Balin's lab, before I joined the lab, um, had shown Sing Chen Tsai's work, um, showed that treating solid tumors with low doses of these epigenetic drugs um, could actually produce very interesting effects. So previously, um, the effects of these have really been seen in leukemia and lymphoma, um, but Steve's lab showed that low doses of demethylating agents caused growth inhibition as well as inhibition of self-renewal. Um, and this just shows that low doses of these drugs spare the bone marrow from toxic side effects of high doses. So these low doses, I'm going to give an example here, um, such as 500 nm of azacitidine, um, and you treat in, uh, every day for 72 hours. And then there's long-lasting effects that include inhibition of, um, of tumor growth um, weeks, weeks later after this drug. So we, when, I, when I was in Steve's lab, I and other scientists did a very broad experiment in 77 epithelial cancer cell lines, including breast cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. So we both put these into immune-competent mice um, to assess tumor genicity, so we saw tumor cell inhibition, uh, so inhibition of growth, as well as we isolated DNA to analyze the methylation, isolated RNA to analyze what was being transcribed and, and protein um, to say which pathways were being turned on in these cells that inhibited um, cancer growth. So this is an analysis of the RNA pathways. Um, we're looking at the gene sets upregulated common to three cancer types. We were most interested to see what um, was, was in common between the different solid tumors. And if you look in this pie chart on the left, about 20% of the RNA increase was actually immune-related. Uh, and note that in the down-regulated gene sets, um, this was not the case. So when we look at the, um, the different cancers, we see that this is a, a good percentage of gene sets in all four of these are immune-related. Um, and ovarian cancer actually had um, the highest number here. So we, we actually focused on ovarian cancer to figure out mechanism. And it turns out that um, DNMT inhibition operates the interferon response in cancer cells. So on the left here, I show the our cell's interferon response. And this is any cell in our body's response, kind of innate immune response to foreign species. Sorry. And these species can include um, things like viral double-strand RNA. It can include um, CPGNA from bacteria. It can include bacteria cell surface proteins. Um, these bind to sensors in the cytoplasm or on the cell surface, cause IRF signaling and upregulation of cytokines and chemokines, cause transcription of the type 1 interferons, alpha and beta, release binding to their receptor, and then activation of STAT signaling to cause transcription of interferon-stimulated genes. Um, so these interferon-stimulated genes were the majority of what we saw um, as our response. So, um, these are involved in apoptosis, um, viral RNA destruction, as well as antigen processing and presentation. On the right, I'm just showing you some examples of these, um, these interferon-stimulated genes in two breast cancer cell lines in red, colon cancer in blue, ovarian cancer in green, and then the DKO cell line. So this cell line um, is lacking the DNA methyltransferases, and we're just showing that upregulation compared to its parental cell line, so kind of a genetic mimic of azacitidine treatment. So the interferon response is activated, making the cells more immunogenic. In addition, we see upregulation of antigen processing and presentation. Um, so this is a pathway in which um, the, um, all of the proteins in our cell are chopped up through the proteasome. They go through processing with TAP1 and the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi, and then they're presented in this cloverleaf structure that includes the HLAs, presented out here for recognition by host immune cells. And so we see this upregulated in general in um, colon and ovarian cancer, less than breast cancer. On the right here showing the same graph of the different molecules increased in the, in the different cancers, um, as well as in the DKO cells. Um, so I wanted to note that work has also been done on this from Adam Karp and Kulmeo Odunsi previously to us. So they've shown upregulation of, um, of the antigen presentation as well as certain tumor antigens. So here I, I write male, MHB2, NYE, so one. These are all um, interesting um, cancer-specific antigens um, that are also increased by treatment. 
So this work from Kulia Densi and Adam Karp, um, they showed that when you use a vaccine against this common cancer antigen, um, it is further potentiated by treatment of decided being a DNMT inhibitor. So treating with the DNMT inhibitor upregulates this as well as makes cells more immunogenic um, and improves vaccine therapy, which is exciting. So we had access to samples from patients on epigenetic clinical trials, including in breast and colon cancers. Um, we wanted to know if we would see the same immune upregulation that we saw with our cell line treatments. Um, once again, these patients were treated with a DNMT inhibitor, AZA, and an HDAC inhibitor, MS275. When we look at the immune signaling, um, so th these graphs are going to show each graph as a patient, and we're looking at the interferon response genes. We're looking at the post over pre fold change, the fold change after treatment. In general, the interferon response is quite increased, while well, antigen processing and presentation is increased, but it's not as drastic as the interferon response. So we do see a similar trend in patients. And our colleagues in Steve's lab, um, John Ringel, et cetera, also showed this in non-small cell lung cancer cell lines treated with azacytidine. Um, they saw similar signaling, um, but very interestingly, um, in a trial of five patients, um, they saw some interesting responses. So the patients in this trial were being treated um, with azacytidine and MS-275, epigenetic drugs, um, and the patients were not responding to those drugs, but they were allowed to then go on to therapy of their choice. And in this case, they went on to anti-PD-1 immune checkpoint therapy. Um, the five patients who did that did significantly better than the patients that were just on anti-PD-1. Um, so this is just a plot of the change in target lesions. So going to, from zero, you can see these three patients, um, their lesions got significantly smaller. Um, and then these two patients, they progressed, but all did better than um, the patients on the immune therapy alone. And right now there's a larger trial in about 30 patients testing this hypothesis. Um, so we should have a, a more conclusive answer than the small group of patients. So from this, we learned that epigenetic therapy upregulates immune signaling in cancer cell lines and patient samples, solid tumors. And that there may be some sensitization to immune checkpoint therapy. I wanted to point out that work on this had been done previously. So CARP had published in the 90s that inhibiting DNA methyltransferase activates um, STAT one, two, and three genes in colon cancer cells. And so this, this had been known before we showed it as well. We were very curious about what the mechanism could be because most of these genes were not methylated at their promoters. The easiest explanation for effects of DNA methylation inhibitors is removal of DNA methylation at the promoters of genes. But these genes were not methylated to begin with. And so we were curious about what could be activating the interferon response. So we did some experiments um, to see whether this was a canonical interferon response. On the left, again, I show you um, the kind of schematic of the interferon response, and we blocked this at the interaction of interferon alpha and beta with its receptor. When you do that, we also blocked it at, we inhibited STAT1, and we inhibited double stranded RNA sensors, including the MAVs adapter protein and TLR3. When you do that, you rescue the response. And so on the right, I'm just showing an example of data from this. So here in the TICNU over in cancer cell line, the blue is going to be untreated, and the red... The red is treatment with azacytidine. So we see a big increase in these interferon-stimulated genes. And then as the bars get darker in color, we've added higher and higher doses of the anti ifnar 2 antibody, once again, so blocking this response. You can see this increase in signaling that is then rescued over time by blocking the response. So it's a canonical interferon response that, re that requires interaction between um, the type 1 interferons and their receptors, that requires cell one signaling, and that requires sensing of double-stranded RNA kind of like viral RNA. And we further showed that this was um, a result of viral R of uh, cytoplasmic RNA by doing some experiments where we actually isolated nucleic acids from cells that, were that had been treated with azacytidine and transfected into recipient cells. So here you can see um, that there are different sensors in our cytoplasm for different nucleic acids. We took just the cytoplasmic nucleic acids, transfected them into recipient cells, and measured interferon activation. When we did that, you can see that the cytoplasmic RNA in two different cell lines significantly increased the interferon response, as did the poly-A fraction of that, while the DNA was not in, it, it causing this response, and the non-poly-A RNA not really either, pointing to us uh, an RNA effect, likely poly-A RNA. So after all of this, we were very curious about what could be providing the double strand RNA. We obviously did not have a viral infection. Um, we just had a drug treatment. Um, and this gets us into the literature of, of what was termed um, in the 2003 sequencing of the human genome, junk DNA. 
Um, so we know that non-coding DNA is more than 80% of both the human and mouse genomes. What's very interesting is that our DNA methylation, about 90%, is located in this non-coding DNA. Um, and we specifically focused on something called endogenous retroviruses or ERVs. These are retroviruses kind of like HIV that integrated into our, our genome a long time ago. Um, and they have been maintained. So some of them have integrated as far away as mice from us, some have been in, in primates, and some are human-specific. These in general, um, they cannot form functional viral particles. So they have not been conserved functionally. Um, in general, we have the methylation regulated silencing of this DNA to maintain genome stability. So in general, these are DNA methylated structures. Um, this is just showing you that transposable elements make up 45% of our genome, a lot more than you think. And the herbs are shown here in this yellow pie slice, about 8% of our genome. I'll also talk later about line and sign elements. That's other transposable elements in our genome. Most are silenced by DNA methylation. And there had been previous work on this, um, including from Goodkoff's group, that showed that when you treated P53 null cells with um, decitabine, you see an increase, and this is the orange bars here, um, in the um, the interference stimulated genes that we saw as well. Um, and they um, hypothesized this was due to a lack of P53 repression as well as a lack of DNA methylation of these repetitive elements, including ERVs. So we hypothesize that Azar is removing methylation on the ERVs, producing viral RNA, and triggering the interferon response. And we worked with Pam Stressel and Reiner Strick at the University of Erlangen in Germany, who are experts in ERVs. And we used qPCR amplicons to about 20 different ERV families on the x-axis of this graph here. Um, and we looked at these over time in a time course of ASA treatment. So once again, um, we treat with ASA for three days, and then day three is at the end of that treatment, and then we're looking at one, three, and six days later. You can see here that um, there is an upregulation in the ERV expression, especially at day seven, which coincides with the interferon response. So we do see upregulation of these elements. Um, I just wanted to show on the bottom graph that this is a measurement of total ERV molecules, so not looking at individual ones, but total molecules. We do see significantly increased um, in um, the in two out of three cell lines in general. We do see it in a significant increase in the total amount of ERV RNA. Um, and these are controlled by DNA methylation. So here on the left, we're looking at the ERV molecules of the FC2 and ERV91 in the DKO cell line, which is lacking the methyl transferases compared to its parental HD2116. They're significantly increased there. And we also see that the um, ERVs lose methylation um, with azathioprine treatment. Here we're looking at methylation-specific PCR. So this PCR is going to amplify bisulfite converted DNA um, and will produce specific amplicons for methylated versus unmethylated DNA. Um, here I'm just showing you the water is clean. This is a the the methylated positive control is all methylated at these two loci. H2116 is all methylated, but the DKO cells lose methylation. And the MOC is methylated, but the AZA loses methylation. Um, we now have genome-wide studies that have um, confirmed this as well at many different loci. So then we wanted to know if these ERVs individually can cause an interferon response. And we did some experiments where we actually overexpress these ERVs. So here, um, we have overexpressed different vectors, including two control plasmids that have the GFP or estrogen receptor, and then four different um, ERVs. So actually blue, red, and green are different ERVs. Green is just two different um, plasmids, the same ERV. So here you can see that overexpressing the blue, red, or the green um, significantly increases the interferon response genes um, compared to overexpressing um, genic plasmids. Um, so these ERVs themselves, independent of epigenetic therapy, can cause an interferon response. So to conclude this portion of the talk, um, we now know that um, transcription of endogenous retroviral genes is normally repressed by um, methylation, but DNA methylation inhibitors remove that, causing up, um, increase in double-strand RNA and binding to the RIGI and MDA5 sensors, which causes an interferon response, immune activation, and decreased proliferation of cancer cells. Um, and I wanted to point out that we submitted back-to-back -back papers with Danda Carvalho's group, and they had showed the same mechanism in colon cancer um, and really showed an effect on colon cancer initiating cells. So we had showed kind of the immune mechanism. They had showed the stem cell mechanism. Um, so that was um, really important, um, a really important uh, kind of confirmation of our, our work with each other that we submit them together.
Um, so we were also curious about how this can affect cancer patients uh, and whether this signaling can activate and recruit host immune cells. So to go into that, I wanted to give like a very quick kind of primer on host immune cells and immune tolerance in cancer because not everyone's familiar with that. <clears throat> so this is from a really great review by Bob Schreiber and colleagues. Um, so looking up here at the top, your normal cells um, do not express anything that we would call like danger signals. Um, cancers are caused by things like carcinogens, radiation, viral infection, inflammation, and mutations. And with these, tumors are going to express specific antigens that are different from normal cells, but also express ligands for natural killer cells. Um, and um, they'll also kind of uh, secrete danger signals, showing that they're different from normal cells. Um, we can then have intrinsic tumor suppression, like senescence or apoptosis or repair, or uh, as the cancer grows, immune cells can come back in. Here's your transformed cells. Immune cells, including CD8 T cells, natural killer cells, can come in and um, with dendritic cells and macrophages clear um, the cancer cells here. So they're using, these are just a bunch of different cytokines. Don't worry too much about specifics here, but basically all these danger signals and antigens bring in host immune cells to eradicate um, the cancer cells. So in general, CD8 T cells and NK cells are good and can um, kill the tumor cells. CD4 cells can help out, and so can dendritic cells and macrophages. Okay, if that doesn't happen, the cancer cells can actually push back at the host immune system and come to equilibrium here, where um, there's, you can see a lot fewer um, of the immune cells here and some, immune, and some suppressive cytokines being released. And as is in the case with, um, sorry, with any um, in cancers that are actually diagnosed, that are big enough to be diagnosed, they have something called immune escape, where you have um, suppressive ligands like PDL1 and the tumor cells, IDO production by macrophages, all of these things that are going to suppress the host immune system so that it cannot attack the cancer. Um, there, there are also things like CTLA4, which is on CD8 T cells, which is an inhibitory molecule. Um, as well as suppressive cells called Tregs and myeloid derived suppressor cells. These are all going to prevent um, the immune system from killing the cancer cell and, and promote tumor growth. So I find this to be a really helpful graphic um, for what happens as a tumor develops and then as it escapes the immune system. So something that has been very much in the news lately, um, for the past decade I would say, is the use of cancer immune therapy. So to reanimate our T cells to attack tumor cells. This is the breakthrough of the year in science in 2013. Um, and something that we've known for a long time in ovarian cancer, on the right here I'm showing overall survival of ovarian cancer patients, is that having T cells in your tumor is a very good marker for prognosis. And so here we're just looking at the survival over time of patients with intratumoral T cells compared to those without them. So we've known for a long time that this is important. We have not had the tools to activate our host immune system to fight the cancer yet. So we found that um, we, we wanted to first look at the um, genome level and TCGA and cancer genome atlas of ovarian tumors to see um, whether our, our interferon response, we call our ASA up regulated viral defense genes, um, are going to cluster these tumors. And so if you look here, uh, this heat map, every column is a different tumor. Um, and then we're looking at the um, from blue to red. Blue is low, red is high, um, RNA level of these genes. Um, and you can see here that there's definitely three clear clusters, so low, high, and medium. And that these in general cluster with the more immune reactive subtype, the subtypes are in this bar at the top, the more immune reactive subtype in red of ovarian cancer that has the better prognosis. So it does look like this, this predicts better prognosis. Um, what's more important is that the ERVs in the viral defense genes correlate in primary ovarian cancer tumors. So um, these are tumors that have not been treated with anything. These are uh, tumors that have, are taken upon surgery and then we make RNA from them. So here again, every column is a patient. And we separate them out into tumors with low and high ERV expression. The ones with high ERV expression, the ones that have stars, have significantly higher levels of the interferon response genes here. So high ERVs predict high interferon response, um, which is what we would predict based on the, um, the DNMT inhibitor results. So then I discussed the immune microenvironment of cancer. The idea behind immune checkpoint blockade is to block this interaction between the suppressive PDL1 on tumors and PD1 on effector T cells. So to block that and then reactivate um, the T cells cytokines against the tumor. 
as well as blocking the inhibitory CTLA-4 interaction um, with um, uh, EPCs that then inhibits a vector T cell. So you want to block these two interactions. And we know that immune checkpoint blockade therapy produces durable and long-lasting responses in solid tumors. Um, three good examples are melanoma, lung cancer, and kidney cancer. Um, but I want to point out that really besides melanoma, the majority of patients do not respond to immune therapy alone. So the response rate in most solid tumors is 20% or below. When patients respond, they do very well, but it's not a big proportion of patients. Um, a lot of data has shown that this may be due to the neoantigen load or the amount of mutations in a tumor that produce new antigens for the cells to recognize, as well as whether T cells are in the tumor. So um, we, translationally, we want to use epigenetic therapy to increase immune signaling in tumor cells to recruit and activate host immune cells and sensitize to immune therapy. So the first thing we did was um, we collaborated with colleagues at Sloan Kettering. So this is Tim Chan's group. And they had clinical trials running um, of anti-CTLA-4 in melanoma. So here, once again, every column is a patient. And um, the red patients benefited from um, the anti-CTLA-4. The blue patients did not. Um, you can see here, looking at the interferon response genes, the ones that benefited had significantly higher levels of these interferon response genes, and that's quantified in the right as well. So these predict melanoma response. We were then curious about what if the patients that had the low levels of interferon response genes, could we treat them with azacitidine and sensitize them to immune therapy? And we did this in a mouse model of melanoma. So here we're looking at the tumor size over time, and um, if, there's a lot going on here, but this is the untreated tumor here. Um, and then if you treat with anti-CTLA-4, um, there's some response, but it's not, um, it's not very big. When you treat with four different doses of azacitidine, there's also not much of an effect. But when you combine the two of them, there's a significantly bigger effect than anti-CTLA-4 alone. So we do see some sensitization to immune therapy in this mouse model. And we can add that to our working model here. So we have inhibition of methylation, leads to transcription of herbs, activation of double-strand RNA-sensing proteins, interferon signaling, cancer cell apoptosis, and activation and recruitment of host immune cells. Oh, and we, we hypothesize activation and recruitment of host immune cells. So um, we then wanted to try this in a mouse model of ovarian cancer. Um, so here, once again, I'm showing you the, um, the schematic of treating cancer with epigenetic drugs. Um, azacitidine and DAC, as well as HDAC inhibitors, which we're using two called ITF2357 and MS275. So these, interestingly, don't seem to upregulate the interferon response alone, but they can increase upregulation with azacitidine. So here we're looking at the interferon response, and this is actually in a lung cancer cell line. Um, and the blue shows the HDAC inhibitor. We don't really see an increase with that alone. Aza in red, we do see these genes increased. But the biggest increase comes from a combination of the two. We were curious to see if herbs were upregulated by the combination. And in these two loci, we do see that while the HDAC inhibitor alone does not do much, ASA increases them and the combination increases them further. Right now in my lab, we're doing a genome-wide analysis of herbs after DMT inhibitor and HDAC inhibitor treatment. And James McDonald in my lab is working on this. So this is just a very, a, a browser shot. Um, we are combining um, a tax seek, so looking for open chromatin, that's the first four tracks, and we're looking at open chromatin here in the green peaks, with um, methylation, so MEDIP, which is um, immunoprecipitating methylated DNA, and those are the red peaks, combined with restriction digest, the only digested unmethylated DNA, so that uh, those are the green here. So for example, this is a region that has gained um, unmethylated DNA in the AZA treatments, and then RNA-seq, so looking at the RNA-seq in blue of which RNA is transcribed. Um, so um, we have this for seven different cell lines with four different treatments, as you can see here, um, and we're currently analyzing which herbs are increased. In general, we see that the azacitidine has the biggest effect on herb transcription, and that methylation is controlling these um, more so than the HDAC inhibitor acti activation of these. And I wanted to show published work on this as well. So this is not our work, but work from Ting Wong and Christoph Plass group that showed that treating with DNMT and HDAC inhibitors um, can induce the cryptic transcription start sites. So a lot of these are these LTRs, these long terminal repeats, 
Um, and expression of these is further increased by combination of the HDAC and the DNMT inhibitors. Um, and over here, we're just looking at the, what type of DNA this is. So um, the combination, so either DAC, decidabine, or the HDAC inhibitor or the combination increases repetitive DNA, especially these LTRs or ERV elements. And work from Peter Jones' lab, sorry, um, showed that actually combining um, 5-azacitidine with vitamin C um, increases this viral mimicry, this interferon response. So here, um, the vitamin C alone doesn't do much, but the azacitidine does, and the combination of purple is better than um, the azacitidine alone. Uh, the mechanism there is that vitamin C can be um, a, a cofactor for the TET enzymes, which remove methylation. So it's very interesting. Um, so we can add this to our working model here. Um, we were very curious about um, how the epigenetic drugs affect the host immune cells in their relationship with cancer cells. So if you look at this, we know that we have um, interferon signaling, cancer cell apoptosis, and sensitization to immune therapy, but we don't know um, how the activation, if there's different immune cells in the microenvironment and, and whether these are being activated. Um, so we use an immune competent model of ovarian cancer here, where we injected um, what are called MOS cells. These are mouse ovarian surface epithelium cells. So that's um, cells derived from the surface epithelium of a black six mouse that are transformed and um, can actually grow as a cancer cell line. Inject these into the peritoneal cavity of the mouse. So it's a syngenetic model. And then treat with um, azacitidine, HDAC inhibitor, alternating, plus anti-PD-1 to block the, the immune evasion. Once again, reminding everyone that the anti-PD-1 inhibits the interaction between PDL1 and PD1 to activate effector T cells against the tumor. And just to show you that we're seeing the same thing in mice as in humans, we do see activation of these viral defense genes um, by at day three and day 10 of AZA treatment. And we also see activation of mouse herbs. So this is just showing you the mouse genome Herbs are about 5% of the mouse genome, and this is just showing the different structures of these different mouse herbs. They also have lines and signs. And we do see upregulation, although the pattern is a little different. So here, we see upregulation at early time points in, in red, but then we do see some downregulation later on. Um, I think because of the interferon response we're activating, it has lots of things that destroy viral RNA. Um, in vivo, we do see a more consistent upregulation. This is taking the tumors out of the mice at the end of the experiment we see a more consistent upregulation of especially these IAP elements. So the immunological results here, we, we took the tumors, uh, the ascites in the tumors, and we did immunophenotyping of the immune cells there. Um, so these are going to be very busy graphs that have um, 12 different groups on them. So here, I'm just going to go through them quickly. The white is MOC, green is, anti, uh, sorry, gray is anti-PD-1, Blue is HDAC inhibitor plus anti-PD-1. Green is another HDAC inhibitor plus anti-PD-1. Red is AZA plus anti-PD-1. Light purple is AZA plus MST-75 and then add anti-PD-1. Light orange is ITF plus AZA, another HDAC inhibitor, and then adding anti-PD-1. So I'll try to summarize these results. Really, there was a significant increase in T cells in the immune microenvironment um, in all of the AZA-treated groups. So all of the, the um, the right six groups here. We also saw an increase in T effector cells, but only for some groups. So the T effector cells were significantly increased in the combination epigenetic therapy groups. Those are the CD8 T cells that express interferon gamma. We also see a similar increase in T helper cells. So um, of the CD4 cells that express interferon gamma that can secrete cytokines to help the CD8 cells kill the tumor cells. We also saw an increase in activated natural killer cells. These are cells, remember, that can recognize tumor cells by the ligands they present, not specifically antigens, but that they look kind of weird compared to normal cells that can kill them. Uh, these were increased in a lot of the um, epigenetic therapies in general. So we see increase in AZA as well as combination therapy. We see a reduction in so-called myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and these are the ones that can inhibit T cells. So comparing mock to a lot of the treatments, um, we see a reduction there. And that had been previously published um, by several groups showing that epigenetic therapy reduces these MDSCs. Um, we also see a reduction um, in macrophages overall. Um, so this is just looking at any macrophages, and in the ASA groups, there's fewer than in the, um, the um, 
individually treated groups with anti-PD-1 or histidine inhibitors. I want to clarify that we just did very broad macrophage stain here, and now we're characterizing M1 versus M2 macrophages. Uh, and then lastly, we see that activation of interferon signaling in immune cells. So when we sorted CD8, CD4, um, and then C11B, which will be myeloid cells from these mice, um, we do see um, some interferon response, I, I would say, in these cells, um, although it's much less than we see in the epithelial cells. So we do see an increase in the interferon response, um, but it's not as significant as in the epithelial cells. We do see some interferon signaling here. And I wanted to kind of summarize this paper um, showing that really we're going from a more immune suppressive to immune permissive microenvironment, as seen in this cartoon, where the mock ovarian cancer microenvironment has very few T cells and NK cells. It has a lot of suppressive macrophages and myeloid cells here. And then um, when you have either treatment, you bring in more T cells, but adding the HDAC inhibitor is what's necessary to activate the um, T cells um, against the tumor and kill the tumor. So going to a more immune permissive microenvironment. <clears throat> and the results, the tumor burden results really mimic this immune, uh, the immune analyses. Um, so here we're just looking at the ascites burden, the tumor burden in these mice. You can see that it's significantly affected by AZA, but the best um, effect was the combination with the anti-PD-1 and the two epigenic drugs. And the survival mimics that. So I'm only showing several of the, of the um, groups here. I'm only showing any of the groups. But if we look at the mock compared to the triple combination, it's significantly better. Um, although it's not, um, we're definitely not curing the mice here. We're, we're continuing to do experiments now where we treat with the anti-PD-1 continuously to see if we can get better results. So I wanted to point out that we're not the only ones doing this work. Um, Michael Goldberg's work showed that when you treat with a DNMT inhibitor decidabine, um, this synergizes with anti-CTLA-4 and the mouse ovarian cancer models, once again bringing in T cells to kill the tumors. And a very beautiful paper from Weiping Zoo in Michigan showed that um, chemokines like CXCL9 and CXCL10 are epigenically suppressed and that when you treat with epigenetic drugs, you express those from tumors, bring in host immune cells, and sensitize to anti-PD-1. And lastly, um, from Steve's group, I was a part of this work as well, Michael Topper's work showed um, that treating with DNMT and HDAC inhibitors activates ERVs and interfering in epithelial cells as well as antigen presentation and secretion of cytokines, but also can help to reverse T-cell exhaustion um, in a mouse model of lung cancer. So reversing immunization in lung cancer. Um, so what we were very curious about in our model was whether the interferon response was crucial to this, to this um, activation of host immune cells. So we took um, our mouse model again, and we treated with azacitidine, but we added this anti-FNR1 antibody to block the um, type 1 interferon response. And here you can see that um, on our on immune level, the amount of immune cells per mil of ascites here is significantly increased in aza compared to MOC. But then when you treat with this anti-FNR1, that is gone. So the immune recruitment is gone. The effect on T effector cells is also gone when you block the interferon response. So usually there's more in the tumor microenvironment, but that's gone, as well as activated natural killer cells. Um, that's significantly reduced with, when you block the interferon response. In terms of tumor burden, um, we see obviously a big difference in ascites volume. So the tumor burden mock compared to AZA treatment is significantly reduced. But then when you block the interferon response here, um, that that difference is pretty much gone. So we need to have the type 1 interferon response to have this AZA effect. And the survival really mimics this, where um, you can see in the solid triangles here, um, the AZA response, uh, is, the mice treated with AZA are living longer, but then when you inhibit the interferon response, um, that's gone. So it's definitely necessary in this context. Some interesting results from our work is that really the tumor burden here um, is controlled by immune cells in the combination so what I'm showing you here is the ascites amount. Um, we are comparing the black six mice, the immune competent mice, to the same experiment done in NSG mice, mice lacking T, B, and NK cells. <clears throat> and note that the response, um, that the mock and the two HDAC inhibitors in blue and green look very similar, and the ASA actually looks quite similar. And so we think this is due to cell intrinsic effects, the interferon response. But the combination groups, the adding of the HDAC inhibitor, um, looks like it only benefits the immune competent mouse model. And so in these combination groups, the tumor burden is controlled by immune cells. Uh, and that's, this is also true for the, um, 
the effects of the anti-FMR1 antibody, once again, I'd already shown you this graph on the right of the black six mice, how blocking the interferon response um, reduces the AZA effect significantly, but then in NSG mice, this does not matter. So we need to have immune cells to control the response. And sorry, this I already showed you this slide. Um, so what I also wanted to show was more recent data from Ben Youngblood's group um, that showed that um, epigenetic silencing of certain genes in T cells is really important for um, the, the activation of T cells. And so they showed that, um, sorry, that naive T cells um, can have de novo DNA methylation to turn them into T effector cells to kill the tumors. But then there's lots of methylation that happens to make exhausted T cells so that um, PD-1 blockade is less effective on these because the T cells are already exhausted. But when you treat with a DNA demethylating agent, DNMT inhibitor, um, you reverse the exhaustion of these T cells and make anti-PD-1 blockade much more effective. Um, so Youngblood's group really focused on the, the immune cells to show that these DNMT inhibitors can have great effects on the immune cells, plus the effects that we have shown on the tumor cells to create a much more robust immune response. So um, in general, then, I've shown you that when we inhibit DNMTs, we cause expression of ERFs, um, activation of double strand RNA sensing proteins, <clears throat> and interferon signaling, cancer cell apoptosis, as well as activation and recruitment of host immune cells and sensitization to immune therapy. Um, we've also shown that HDAC inhibitors can play a role here of activating um, the expression of, of these repetitive elements, including ERFs. Um, and then there are also direct effects on T cell gene transcription, shown mostly by other groups, including Ben Young Blood's group, um, as well as Michael Topper and Steve's lab, um, that will reverse exhaustion of T cells. So our ongoing work really involves analyzing results from clinical trials that are happening in lung cancer and ovarian cancer, combining DNA and T inhibitors, and in some cases, HDAC inhibitors with anti-PD-1. And so we're following those trials to see how the patients respond, we also um, are, uh, will be able to analyze um, the samples from those trials to see whether um, we're seeing the same immune activation, interferon response activation that we've seen in cell lines as well as in mouse um, samples. So I'd like to acknowledge um, my lab on the left here, um, as well as leadership at the GW Cancer Center. Uh, I talked mostly about work that had done uh, in, my, in my postdoc and then finished up here, but working with Steve Balin and Cindy Zano at Johns Hopkins, as well as I mentioned my collaborators at the University of Erlangen. Um, our whole genome work that we've been doing with Ting Wong at WashU, he's been a really a great help and collaborator. Um, and I want to acknowledge funding from NCI as well as the Mathers Foundation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chapinelli, for that wonderful presentation. Our first question is, can you explain what is meant by exhausted T cells? So good question. Basically, the definition of exhausted T cell is one that's no longer going to um, be able to produce interferon gamma to act against the tumor cells. So for whatever reason, um, these cells are no longer active um, and cannot produce interferon gamma and perforin and all those molecules that let them kill tumor cells. Um, the, the molecular things that are happening here is actually DNA methylation of specific genes. Interferon gamma is one of them um, that prevent um, T cell function. For our next question, when the mice were treated with AZA, the HDAC inhibitor, and anti-PD-1, why were the AZA and HDAC inhibitor given on alternating schedules as opposed to together? Oh, good question. So that's, I didn't explain that. That's work that was done by Michael Topper that's published in his paper that I referenced here, where he showed that alternating these drugs is more effective than giving them at the same time. And that's because um, HDAC inhibitors can inhibit this, can prevent uh, cell cycle progression. Um, because DNMT inhibitors mostly affect the DNMT1 enzyme, and that's really responsible for maintenance DNA methylation, as in methylation of the newly made DNA strand during DNA synthesis, um, cells need to be going through S phase um, for the drug to work. And so if you would treat at the same time, the azocytidine has no effect. To your knowledge, has this combination been used in clinical trials for treating patients? I, I think there have been some in AML, um, but were they, that was not better than AZA alone. The problem is a lot of the clinically available HDAC inhibitors are quite toxic, so like ramadepsin, um, is very, is very toxic. It inhibits a lot of HDACs. Um, so there's about, you know, 11 different HDACs 
Um, and the ones we use are very much like nuclear HDAC specific, so HDAC 1 and 2. Um, and those are the ones that are in clinical trials right now, which is the triple combination. So DNMT inhibitor, HTAC inhibitor, and anti pd one um, So I think we will learn a lot more from those. Yeah, hopefully. Why do you think that the combination of drugs gives a better response mechanistically? Yeah, I think it's twofold. So um, one is that, um, you know, a big problem in cancer is what we call an immunologically cold microenvironment where um, the tumor has no T cells there to begin with, right? So when you treat with AZA, the interferon response that results produces cytokines that bring in T cells and NK cells and makes a more immunologically hot microenvironment. Then when you add anti-PD-1, you're activating those T cells against the tumor if they've been exhausted. That's the tumor cell effect. Then also from Ben Youngblood's work and Michael's work as well, um, they showed that the direct demethylation of specific genes on the T cells activates them against the tumor too. So it's both in the tumor and the host immune cells. And our next question, do you see a reduction in size of the tumor or just in tumor growth? In the mice, we do, yes. Um, so we definitely see um, big reduction in tumor burden, uh, bigger with the combination with immune therapy. We see it um, for AZA, but definitely, so some of the ones in the, um, in the, for example, the melanoma model, some of the ones actually regressed when you had the combination, which was not seen with either therapy alone. Right. Our next question: Have you looked at PD1 or PDL1 expression in response to epigenetic treatment? Yeah, good question. So, on we definitely have PD1 expression on the T cells that are in the tumor microenvironment. Um, that's normal and kind of shows a T cell that's active and responding, um, but also gives a rationale for treating um, with anti PD1. Um, we don't see that change with any of our treatments. Um, I didn't show you the results in that because it was unchanged. Uh, PDL1 on tumor cells, and I do have data for that that I didn't show, is significantly increased by AZA treatment, which could be a bad thing, right? So we all think of PDL1 as inhibitory, but it's a, it's a natural downstream effect of the interferon response. Um, it is an interferon stimulated gene, and I think it's in, in general that was to kind of prevent autoimmunity. In this case, though, um, it is upregulating PDL1 on cancer cells. Um, I think, once again, showing that you want to combine these two treatments of uh, the AZA plus the anti-PD-1. And our next question, is deregulation of the herbs by DNA methylation necessary for the interferon response? Ooh, good question. Yeah, so that's really hard to answer. Um, what we know is that double strand RNA species that are increased by DNA methylation are necessary for the interferon response because when we take the RNA out of one cell and put it into another cell, that's what causes the response. We don't know whether it's ERVs or line one or alleys, right? Um, so we don't know what type of RNAs. We do know it's RNA. We've proven that, it, and we've proven that ERVs are sufficient. If you overexpress ERVs, you can cause this. But if you overexpress a lot of things, you can cause weird things. Um, so right now, what we're doing is pull downs where we have the sensor proteins and we're pulling down um, the RNAs that bind to them to sequence those, to say what are they sensing? Because it could be a whole, uh, it could be herbs, it could be alu elements, it could be other repetitive elements that are binding. Well, it looks like in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here for today. We will follow up on any remaining questions. If you'd like to watch this webinar again, the recording will be available at genewasweek.com. Also, check out genewasweek.com for more activities, including webinars, exclusive promotions, multiple chances to win, a total of $20,000 in credit for Genewas services, and much, much more.